welcome to the Medical Center Hour, our program Constructing the Quilts of Medicine, Influencing Diversity and Disparities. <clears throat> when academic medicine in the United States begins to reflect the remarkable diversity of the patient population it serves, only then we can potentially start to close some critical gaps in cultural knowledge, the provision of health care, and the education and advancement of future physicians. Today we welcome Dr. Wendy Wills Elamine to talk with us about what's at stake in diversifying, in effect remaking the workforce in academic medicine. An Associate Professor of Family Medicine and Medical Education at Southern Illinois University, Dr. Elamine is actually back on familiar ground where she spent five years, 2005 to 2010, as a faculty member in UVA's Department of Family Medicine and an Assistant Dean of Medical Education, with particular interest and responsibilities in increasing the diversity of the medical school student body and faculty ranks. So this is a bit of a homecoming for her, although she says the remarkable amounts of construction and the other changes here at UVA have made it a bit of a bewildering uh, homecoming in certain, in certain situations. In this Medical Center Hour, Dr. Elamine invokes the traditional art of quilt making for the purpose of engaging us all with urgent questions around how to improve minority diversity in academic medicine's faculty ranks, especially increasing the numbers of African Americans. Like a quilt maker, an institution and its leaders must make the most of existing opportunities and materials, but they also need to create piece together and capitalize on wholly new patterns that will increase minority presence and intensify minority engagement throughout academic medicine, and then lead to changes in healthcare that will address some of this country's glaring health disparities. Dr. Elamine's presentation will be followed by a brief response from UVA School of Medicine's Associate Dean for Diversity, Dr. Greg Townsend. Then, at the close of the hour, we'll have time to hear from you. Neither Dr. Elamine nor Dr. Townsend reported any conflicts of interest with today's presentation. I'd like to thank the Medical School's Office for Diversity and the Department of Family Medicine for partnering with us on this Medical Center Hour and Dr. Elamine's visit. Welcome, Wendy. Good afternoon. Yes, I am from the South. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'd like to, for you all to talk back to me. Um, it has been a wonderful experience coming back to University of Virginia, which was the birthplace of my academic medicine and the birthplace of my three daughters. I would like to thank Dr. Townsend in the Office of Diversity, uh, Dr. Norman Oliver, and being in family medicine, it has been a wonderful opportunity, and Dr. Childress for allowing me to use some um, unique analogies to really try to push the envelope around diversity. I have no disclosures. My objectives I'd like to start with is to really identify the diversity and disparity gaps in academic medicine. I want us to explore what approaches have actually occurred to increase diversity. And lastly, I'd like us to cultivate some interpersonal and reflective strategies for addressing the lack of diversity in academic medicine. So in 2002, I think we're all familiar with the unequal treatment. Uh, recently, we saw in the New England Journal of Medicine, they started to add bias, black lives, and academic medicine. And what they found is that black-white disparities persist in patient outcomes for medical education, faculty recruitment, and almost every single disease. And at this point, this is normally where uh, many of my colleagues start to put up graphs uh, to illuminate some of the statistics. But I think sometimes those statistics really depersonalize things. People start to forget that they're really individuals that are in that number. So I want to personalize it. Because I am an African American woman, my chances of dying in childbirth are four times more. Because I am an African American woman, my three daughters had a chance of not making it to the age of one at an increased rate. Because I'm an African-American woman, my colleague, you may be diagnosed with breast cancer, but my chances of dying from it is much higher. 
My chances of developing HIV are eight times higher. My chances of developing chlamydia and gonorrhea, 19 times higher. So these are the real statistics. These are the problems that we need to be addressing in academic medicine. We can't address them in the same ways that we've always addressed them. So I was challenged to really look at what is academic medicine and how does this relate to diversity? And then I started saying, well, in academic medicine, is, are they talking about the who? Are they talking about the faculty? Are they talking about what we're teaching, the art of actually teaching it, how we're teaching it? Are we teaching it in the community or are we teaching it among these walls? Or is it about the why? Why are we really doing this? We're doing this because we want to save lives. We're doing this because we really want to attack the statistics one by one. To me, I feel like academic medicine is an opportunity to discover, it's an opportunity to educate, to advance patient care, but also to challenge assumptions, assumptions that have existed for over 200 years. It's an opportunity for us to look at social responsibility, to be cutting edge, and those of us on the promotion tenure process, of course, teaching, research, and service, and also to be innovative in the curriculum. But I think it's important that we stop and look at academic medicine on a granular level. And when I say granular level, what's really happening inside of our minds? And academic medicine can only make a change if we're transparent, if we allow ourselves to truly be vulnerable, we start thinking outside of the box, we take risks, we start playing a little bit. If we speak the truth and we make sure that we force other people to speak their truth as well. We have many people who are sitting around the table and they're not necessarily telling their truth. They're not sharing that truth with you. So it's hard for us to really make these transformations. We need to make sure that we're listening to not only what's being said, but what has not been said. And make sure that we're creating those opportunities and reaching for a vision that I really haven't seen yet. But that's why we have to keep reaching. So here at UVA, I started to learn about mindfulness in medicine. So in mindfulness in medicine, they always say you need to be still. So I became very still, and this is one of my favorite quotes. It says, only in still waters can you see your true reflection. You know, in medicine, the waters are always moving. When you look at yourself, you're not sure if you're going up or down or who you really are. So when I thought about this assignment to talk about academic medicine and diversity, I came up with this in my still waters. The quill. And I said, are you really going to go there, Wendy? The quilt. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be a risk taker. I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to speak my truth to make sure that I'm helping us move forward as a collective community. So quilts are important to me because they connect me to the struggle of my people, the struggle of my gender. It deepens my understanding with my work with diversity. Americans and women, their traditional arts such as needlework, quilts, rugs, uh, Dr. Shapiro said that this was really an act of pride, desperation, and necessity. That's what I feel like I'm doing in medicine. I have pride in what I do. I'm desperate to make those changes and I feel like it's acutely necessary. Sometimes we're improvising like the quilter, sometimes we're experimenting, and we're always making choices as we're moving forward and really looking at the complexities. When we look at quilts in academic medicine, both of us truly have this love of touch, that personal touch, that bedside manner. And that's what the quilt is doing, working with textiles and touching. We both have that legacy that appeals to social, gender, class, race, ethnicity, nationality, and political affiliation. Health has no boundaries, just like quilt making. In both of these, we've had a history of women being marginalized. And we have to utilize strategies to execute our vision and illuminate stories that fill the gaps to our knowledge. Every quilt has a story, just as every patient has a story. When we're constructing that quilt, we have to be masterful, strategic, time sensitive, organized, social, but also we have to use different tools. In my 20 years in medicine, diversity has had many approaches. We had holistic admissions. That's what we were doing when I was here on the admissions. Um, 
we added the question, how do you add to the diversity of the class? And whoa, that really started mixing the pot. We really started getting some very deep conversations on the student level, but also on the faculty level. Conversations that needed to happen all because of one question. How faculty is moving through promotion and tenure started to change. The social culture, the milieu of how we're learning, how our curriculum embeds diversity into some of the issues. Looking at retention, recruitment, and also including diversity among the strategic plan. So I wanted us to go through what have been the diversity efforts thus far. I'm going to take you on a little story. 1971, this is when the AAMC said, we need to make a commitment to increasing equality of opportunity by relieving and eliminating barriers. This happened to be the year I was born. I'm not ashamed of my age. I'm 44. <laughs> so in 1971, I was born, I was actually um, born at Hershey Medical Center. What was I doing at Hershey Medical Center? Any guesses? My dad had just been recruited into the first class of African American students at Penn State. And I became the first African American baby born there. Let's fast forward to 1991. A generation later, I became a part of the 3,000 by 2,000, which we did not make, I think, by about 1,000. Fast forward again another 20 years. I'm on admissions in 2002, working on the holistic review process. And now we have a new MCAT for 2015 that's really starting to integrate different concepts that had been on the outskirts of medicine before. Some of the literature that really played an important role for us in transforming how we approach diversity is Dr. Sullivan's Missing Person. I remember when this came out, I said to myself, I'm not a missing person, I'm right here. But then when I started seeing the statistics, I said, wow, I really am a missing person. Unequal treatment. And then also this year, we had the 2015 Altering the Course of Black Males in Medicine. I think that this is an important document that we'll get to later. So who knows what this is? Anybody? Protest in medical school. Okay, she said it's a protest in medical school. This is actually at Columbia University. Last year, I believe on December 10th, um, there was the first protest that medical students had since Vietnam. Over 70 schools came together and they said, we want to be a part of the Black Lives Matter. At Harvard, they lay down for 15 and a half minutes. Why the 11 stood for the time that we heard, I can't breathe. He screamed out 11 times. And the rest of the time represented the 4.5 hours that one of our brothers laid on the street before anybody got him up. These different universities started to rally around and said, you know what, it's not really just about the police. What's happening inside of our institutional walls where we're still developing these health disparities that are not necessarily being addressed on the level that they could. So I think that we need to include the students as our architects. We need to follow what some of the students are saying needs to be addressed. Because if we're not listening to them, and sometimes we're listening, but we're just really hearing the echoes, sometimes we're listening to them and we just have selective hearing. We need to make sure that we're listening to their entire picture in totality. So these are some of the questions I want us to think about today. Diversity is here at the University of Virginia. It's here, but how do we weave it into a deeper fabric? What spaces do we need to try to interface more? Are we just walking by people in the hallway? Are we really engaging them and creating a dialogue that transforms the way we think so that when we're in that patient room, we're bringing up some of those situations? What type of fabric are we dealing with? Are we dealing with the corduroy? Are we dealing with silk that's a little fragile? You know, everything has to be politically correct these days. So it's hard for us to really engage in conversations without tiptoeing around different issues. And what are some of your unconscious biases? What we aim for is this inclusive environment that deals with races, gender, ethnicities, ages, ability levels, perspectives, sexual orientation, and we have made progress. This slide actually shows that in the last 
30 years, we have seen the gender issue starting to reach a peak where we're at 46% women in classes now. However, when we look at race and ethnicity, we're flatlined. I mean, if we were in the ICU, this patient cannot be resuscitated, but we're going to have hope on this. So we need to start to look at the culture so that when people actually are admitted, they're truly getting through with their souls intact. And we can only do that by looking at the campus culture. So it's easy for us to look at the historical legacy we've had with inclusion and exclusion, the compositional diversity. We can look among this room and say, okay, I see a diverse group of people. Organizationally and structurally, we see diverse people at all different levels. But are we really grasping the psychological perceptions of the individuals who are diverse? Are we really looking at the behavioral dimensions that allow people to really speak up, or they're not? I think it's important that we look at what the IOM defined, the climate of diversity. It's the perceptions, attitudes, and expectations that define the institution, particularly as seen from the perspective of individuals from different racial and ethnic backgrounds. It's not necessarily what the majority is saying, it's actually what the minority is saying about the environment. Educational benefits of diversity, and this is how we've been able to still include the issue of race in admissions because it does involve an educational benefit. It improves cognitive and social outcomes among students, it increases our personal growth, enables organizations to excel, some of the literature says that it creates a culture of deeply instilled values and beliefs. And when you look at the M4s, the medical students that are graduating, they were asked to fill in this questionnaire, and many of them are saying, almost 80% are saying, just being next to somebody who has a different perspective from me, I'm actually learning from this. This is adding to my educational experience. But when we get to the faculty, if this was so good for the students, wouldn't it be good for the faculty to still be at the same rate? So I want us to look at this. We've gone from African American, 2.9%. Hispanic Latino, 4%. Multiple races, 1.9%. Native American, 0.1%. So we have a dilution of what's happening among the faculty, but we need to still continue that same mix. There was a study that came out of Johns Hopkins that said faculty members at the United States medical schools who were black were less likely to be retained, less likely to be promoted, to hold senior faculty and administrative positions. And then they started looking at the behavioral and the psychological perceptions and found that underrepresented and minority faculty actually felt that there was a biased view to recruitment. They were unsatisfied at higher rates of professional development. They were four times more likely to be unsatisfied with the level of diversity. Three times as likely to think that they were not being included in networking. So when we're asking faculty members about their experience, these are some of the questions that we need to start asking to make sure that we're strategically approaching some of these issues. And this part that really scared me is that 42.6% of um, minorities in five years felt that they would not be a part of academics. That's a high rate where we're losing many valuable members. I entered this uh, slide to show that when students are actually graduating from medical school, before they graduate, if you look at this one right here, we have pretty high numbers, 9%, 9.3%, 5.7% want to come in to be a faculty member. However, what's happening along that nurturing line where people are deciding to go into other areas? So this is an area that I think that we could try to focus on. So let's go back to my quilts. We've established that quilts um, started to really keep people warm. They were useful, they were functional. It was about taking scraps that nobody else wanted and pulling them together and creating something beautiful. It was about creating a legacy, an heirloom, creating a social bond. So these are two types of quilts. On this side, you actually see it's an applique quilt. To me, this is similar to somebody saying, OK, we don't have diversity. Let's place an African-American or a Hispanic person here. 
and they just place them there, but they don't have that integration, the weaving that occurs that really makes them an important uh, piece of the community. This right here, does anybody see what this is made of? Ties. ties. So this woman took all these ties and put them all together. I think that this is what we aspire to do, is to really take everybody, all the pieces of fabric, and place them together. So I got on my quilting journey, you know, I'm a mother of three, and I'm a good mother. So I wanted to share a legacy. And my legacy was I was going to build a quilt with my 12-year-old for her birthday. So I decided to sign up at Joanne's Fabrics. You all know Joanne's Fabrics? I get in there and I'm all ready for my class. I've gotten all my tools, I've gotten everything ready. And the lady said to me, um, so tell me how long have you been sewing? And I said to myself, I, I might be in trouble. <laughs> and then I said, oh, not very long. And in my head I was saying, I I'm really in the wrong class. I have never sewed in my life and I'm in this quilting class. What am I going to do? So it's like diversity sometimes. We're thinking that it's something simple that we just jump into, but really it's quite complicated. This quilt was about all the things that I needed. Why was I making the quilt? What was the history of the quilt? What types of people were working on quilts? It was quite overwhelming, but being an academic coach as well, I said this is a good opportunity for me to learn about my process of trying to do something new. It was probably the most stressful thing that I had done in a long time. So I want to introduce you to um, some of the historical pieces of quilt making. This is the quilts of Guy Bend. And this is an um, a amazing story that talks about the barriers to diversity. If you look at the parallels, this Guy Bend right here is in Alabama. This was a group of um, people who were actually isolated by the complete Alabama River. There was one road in, and right here, you all see the ferry? Something happened to that ferry in 1964. What, what happened to the ferry? What happened in 1964? The Civil Rights Act happened. Guess where the voting was? Camden. So people could not get from this community across the ferry to get here. Guess how long it took them to rebuild that ferry? 40 years. 40 years. These women, women like this, children like this, stayed in this level of isolation. And out of this, they took every scrap they had and created these beautiful quilts that had been hidden in history that never came out until somebody just stumbled upon this community. And when they stumbled upon this community, they realized what a treasure, what a jewel was actually here. These were some stamps, some commemorative stamps that were made. And these Guy Ben quilts actually have a very interesting look when you look at other quilts. Most of these, the women actually didn't have anything but the clothes that they were wearing. They were able to sometimes bring in different pieces of fabric, but they made a beautiful piece of work. I think it shows us that sometimes you can make something out of nothing. So when we have the richness of all of this, we have to make sure that we're taking it to the next level. That's what our legacy has to be. The quilts of Guy Bend, they had their own vocabulary. It made life bearable. Sometimes these women did quilts on their own. Sometimes they did them in collaboration. They had a visual language. I love that they were called a hotbed of creativity. Isn't that what we are in the academic medicine field? We're a hotbed of creativity. And it's important that each woman express her own individual contribution. This right here is how quilts start. And this is what they become. This is how color adds to the richness of your experience. How many of you all felt moved by this? <coughs> how many of you all felt a little bit more excited by this? Just a little bit more was added. These are all the different appliques that you can involve in quilting. So I'm gonna give you all an opportunity to engage in some active learning. Take out your sheet of paper. Don't be scared. We're supposed to take risks. 
were supposed to be created. The first thing I would like for you all to do is to just think, when you think about diversity, what words actually come up? The first word that comes up when you think of diversity, just jot it down. Now when you think about diversity in medicine, what's something that comes to mind? Just write it down. And then what more words come to mind when you think about what your personal role is in diversity? You can jot as many as you want. And this is the real challenge. I want you to create a symbol that comes to your mind that represents your interpretation of diversity. Be as creative as you want. Okay, so who's going to share? When you all thought about diversity, what were some words that came up for you all? Yes? Minorities. Minorities. Okay, what else? Uh, blending and integration. Great. What else? This is UVA. We have lots of words. <laughs> Any other words? Strength. Strength. Richness. Richness. Rainbow. Rainbow. What else? Conversation. Conversations. Great. Yes? Uh, lack. Lack. Yes. Great. Anything else? All right, so tell me, what were some of those symbols you all came up with? Circle. A circle. Okay. Anybody else have anything? We're supposed to be taking risk, being creative, being transparent, and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. I have lots, lots of circles inside a circle. Lots of circles inside a circle. Gazewood, what did you have? Is that Gazewood up there? Yeah, that's Gazewood. I'm still thinking that. Okay, all right. I'm working on it. Marcia? A box full of colored confetti. Oh, a box filled of colored confetti. I have a tree. A tree. You know, and what's interesting is that everybody has something different. So that really represents all the different approaches that we might have to diversity and what diversity actually means to us. Um, when I did this myself, what came up for me was this. It was a railroad. Can anybody think of why I put a railroad? Continuity and connectedness. My words were innovation, conversation, listening, disparities, hard work, resiliency, excellence, transformation, collaboration. But I'm going to be transparent with you all today. The reason why I put the railroad is sometimes I feel like I'm on the Underground Railroad. I feel like I'm on the Underground Railroad. Sometimes I feel like I'm looking for the next safe house. In diversity, it's not just one group of people. It can't just be African American and Hispanic and Native American people trying to get to the other side. There were Caucasian people. There were different people who had values, who had decided they were going to be a part of this struggle and do what was right. So that railroad is actually my underground railroad. I'd like for us to look briefly at the 2014 class because we are making some successes. This is the first time that the female applicant increased by 6.9%. That's 1,000 women that have entered into the pipeline. The number of Hispanic and Latino matriculates increased by 5.5%. That's 1,800. And similarly, in the past years, we're starting to see a trend where women are starting to get to the level of 47.2%. But we still need to identify where are those gaps. Who do we invite to quilt with us? What stories do we need to share? What do we really need to link together? How do we identify the potential in the scraps? 
So just like medicine has transcended, one thing that has transcended is art in quilts. It used to be that the quilts were just put on the bed. Now we actually have uh, the evolution of the art quilt, where we have freer expressive outlook, unfamiliar territories being explored. Um, people are realizing that they're all students. They're thinking outside of the box. When you look at the one on the right, this is the double band ring. This is another rendition of it from the African American community. There are cultural variations where you have a Hawaiian quilt. Does anybody know what culture the bottom one came from? A Navajo quilt. And this right here is the quilting bee. What do you all see when you all see this quilting bee? Community. Unity. Collaboration. Collaboration. Teamwork. Teamwork. Generation. Generations. Comfort. Comfort. Women. Women. You know what I saw when I looked at this? I saw boardroom. <laughs> I'm a flashback again. Do y'all see the boardroom now? I'm gonna come back one more time. So how would you all feel if you were invited to this quilting bee? What are some of the emotions? Just think I'm not gonna ask you to bring. How would you feel if this were the boardroom? But for many of us, this is what our boardroom looks like. <laughs> this is from a movie I found called 12 Angry Men. <laughs> Maybe y'all knew about it, it was new to me. And where we need to get the boardroom is to look like this. Uh, being a family physician, this is a time that I think it's important for us to try to integrate some of the medical principles. And in the Journal of Women's Health, there's a group from the University of Wisconsin. And what they said is that back in the day, when you looked at smoking in the hospital, I remember when I used to do rounds with my father, and I was like, I don't want to go in here. It was the smoke that I didn't want to be around. People were actually smoking in the ICU, smoking down the wards. But now, would we ever even think about somebody smoking in the hospital? No, it would be an atrocity. That's how we need to look at diversity. If we walk into a room and there's no diversity, we need to start feeling like that same visceral feeling we get when we see somebody smoking. So there's stages of change. Um, and Dr. Carnes talked about pre-contemplation. That's when you're really thinking about, well, you know, I think, I think we're okay the way we are. What's wrong with the way we've always done it? Then there's contemplation. Oh, we need to get more role models in here. That's what the dialogue sounds like when people are in contemplation. Then there's action. That's when you start to hire somebody. When you become determined that you're going to make a change, you've set your stop date for smoking, and then you say, I'm going to go ahead and hire somebody. And then you get into maintenance. And I really feel like University of Virginia has moved to that maintenance period. We look very different from what we looked like five years ago. Structurally, organizationally, very different. However, when we look at where we could get into trouble, it could be um, recidivism, where all of a sudden you lose one person and you slip back to the same place that we might have been. And that's why it's important for us to look at this. In the maintenance stage, this is what you're saying. I'm proud of the advances our school has made in diversity. You're in recruiting mode. You're discussing strategies. I think that that's the place that we are in and really trying to move forward with this. The only way we're going to maintain things is if we start to do um, what's called phenomenological research. And with that, we're looking at certain phenomenons that people are experiencing. Have you all seen this book recently? This is called Black Man in a White Coat. He's talking about his experience moving through his journey of becoming a physician. He was able to capture what those phenomenons were. W.E.B. Du Bois, I think that he used to capture what the phenomenons were. He said that African Americans negotiate two identities, one as an American citizen and the other as an oppressed African descendant in America. So we have a double consciousness. 
And this was a new word for me, racial fatigue. I said, oh, is that what it's called, racial fatigue? 20 years ago, Dr. Nickens actually looked at um, black men's success in admissions to the graduation from medical school. And he said the key elements that allowed students to be accepted and actually graduate was social support, the education they had before they came in, the ability to identify with the group, their faith, their social responsibility, being able to contribute. And recently, the AAMC just did a similar document looking at black males in medicine altering the course. And this was unveiled at the NMA this year in 2015. And it said that between 1978 and 2014, the year my father was in medical school, they had 578 black males in medical school. Guess how many we have today? 524. 578 down to 524. And we're in a time where we're having increased population with minorities, we're having further health disparities. This is something that we truly need to stop and take a look at. And they started to identify through research what allowed individuals to be successful. One it was what was happening K through 12. So we really need to continue those pipeline programs. It's also the public perception and the image of a black man. What's happening on television? Is the career looking attractive? Financially, what's happening? The socialization of the pre-med process. Is it cool to be a doctor or is it cool to be a businessman? How can we get more people to really embrace that they can be a physician? I was talking to my father this morning and I said, well, Dad, how is it that you, what did, what did you see that made you want to become a doctor? And he said, well, I saw them all in the community. They were everywhere in the community. So through segregation, there were some protective factors. And now everybody's integrated. The doctors are over here sometimes. And the children never have the opportunity to see somebody that looks like them to begin to even reach out and think that that's something that they can focus on. And I think it's important that we look at resiliency because this is what's going to get all the students who are here over to the next level. Dr. Epstein from the University of Rochester, he talks about resiliency being the ability of an individual to respond in a healthy, adaptive way such that personal and professional goals are achieved at minimal psychological and physical costs. I know a lot of medical students and I tell them, make sure you graduate with your soul intact. Come out looking a little bit like your personal statement. Don't change so much. Don't allow this process to change your your vision for what you wanted to bring to medicine. <coughs> Dr. Jensberg is a pediatrician from the University of Pennsylvania and he studied homeless teens. And what he found is that there were different qualities that allowed these teens to survive on the street. And these different qualities were the ability to feel competent, confident, being truly connected, having character, being able to contribute to their environment, having the ability to cope and the ability to actually control their environment. And I was discussing with a couple of medical students recently, it's really hard in medical school because you have no control over your time. It's hard to cope sometimes to even find somebody to reach out to. Sometimes you don't have time to contribute because your greatest contribution is becoming a physician as opposed to doing all the community service that you really want to do. And it's hard to feel confident. But these are areas that we should try to focus on. So as we're building our UVA quilt, I keep saying we, I still feel like I belong here. But as we're building our UVA quilt, we need to maintain that yes, we are trying to heal, we're trying to take care of people. But we also need to start thinking about what's our legacy that we're gonna leave behind? Are we adding to the curriculum? Are we giving students that hotbed of creativity to really develop of how they're going to approach things when on the outside? Are we making memories? Are we recognizing that, yes, our materials that we're working for are not necessarily perfect, but how can we transform them? So I hope that you will all think about being a part of the Underground Railroad, create some more of those safe houses, and allow this to become more of an organic process. You know, sewing, when you think about it, it's an organic process. 
I learned with my sewing machine, if I move forward and I jerk and come back, it's not organic yet, but I intend for it to be in the next year. <laughs> but organic, when it comes to medicine, it's about that attitude that we take. It's about being vulnerable, not having all the answers, having those meaningful conversations that are sometimes uncomfortable, and sometimes saying, you know, I don't know what the politically correct way of saying this is, but I really want to have a deeper understanding of this. So just like the quilt lingo, we have all these different lingos, the backing, the batting, the blocks. There's also bias tape. We have implicit bias in medicine. And that refers to the unconscious racial stereotypes that grow from our personal and cultural experiences. We have different stitches. Everybody's going to have their own way that they approach the diversity and they weave things into the fabric. Don't be afraid to do things differently. Just because the studies say that this is the best way, come up with what your best way is. Listen to the students. Listen to the, what the faculty needs are. And think outside of the box. So I want to end with, I think that one technique in quilting that might be a way for us to move forward, that's planned random. That's where the quilt maker uses fabric randomly yet carefully considers particular elements of plan laid out. So we have to have what that foundation is going to look like, but we have to have the ability to be flexible in that process. So in order for us to have some conversation, I'm going to stop here. These are some of my bibliography that I utilize, and I'm going to let Dr. Townsend come up from here. so much, Wendy. That was terrific, very thought-provoking. Um, I'm just going to take a couple minutes. Um, you know, Dr. Alameen said she wants to bring things down to the personal, so I'm going to bring this to the personal. Uh, that's the UVA School of Medicine class of 1960 up there in the upper left. If you squint real hard, there are two women in the picture. Um, and it doesn't take a whole lot of squinting to see that there are no minorities in that picture. I graduated from the class of 1986. I can't find a picture of the class of 1986 anywhere, so you just have to imagine as I tell you what it looked like. Uh, there were three minorities in the class, including myself, and the class of 120, um, and there I would guess maybe 20% women. So, some progress from 1960 to 1986. There's still a lot of work to do. This is the class of 2018, so the class that entered last year. 28% underrepresented minorities, so African American, Latino, and about 50% women. This is more like what's happening out in the real world. These are the people who are going to be taking care of the patients out there in the real world. And our patients are going to feel a whole lot better about people that are coming out of our medical school because they're going to look like them, they're going to think a little bit like them, they're going to talk like them, and they'll feel a lot better about their, their uh, concordance. But this is a medical school, right? This isn't a social gathering. This isn't a beauty pageant. It's not all about what it looks like. It's really about academics. And I know what you're all thinking. All right. So we've got all these women and these minorities where the small brains infiltrate in our medical school. What's that going to do to the academics here? That's going to destroy things, right? I mean, UVA was up here. We got these small brain people. We're going to bring it down a notch, right? Not so fast, my friend. <laughs> so, 2003, you know, Dr. Ellen talked about the change in the holistic review process, the admissions process, when she was there. Dr. Canterbury was head of the admissions uh, committee and said, you know, we can do better. We need to do better. We need to make some changes here. And they made a very concerted, determined effort to increase the diversity in the medical school class at that time. So, it was about 6% women then. Oops. About six percent, or rather, underrepresented minorities um, at that time. Twenty-eight percent entered the class last year. Twenty-one percent this year. This is about where we've been for the last decade or so. As that has happened, these are our board scores. Step one gone up by about ten points. Step two gone up by twelve points. Diversity is excellence. When you have people bringing different perspectives, different backgrounds, different languages, different thought processes to the table, what you get is a better product. 
That's why we need diversity. There are lots of reasons for bringing a more diverse group in at any level. But the bottom line is you want whatever it is that you're doing to be better than what you could have done. And if you bring a diverse group in, and they, there are studies showing this in entertainment, you know, TV shows, uh, in the law, in academics, in business, if you bring a diverse group to bear, your product, whatever their product is going to be, is going to be better. We want a better product. We want better students. We want better care. We want better research. If we have a more diverse student body, if we have a more diverse house staff, if we have a more diverse faculty, a more diverse professional staff, we're going to achieve that. We would like to think that we, as scientists and physicians and physician scientists, we like to look at the data very objectively and come out you know, it's very Spock-like with analyses that come to the root of the problem and we don't take into consideration race or gender or sexual orientation or age or all the rest of those things, but we all do. As Dr. Alameen pointed out, we are all subject to unconscious bias. I don't know if anybody has seen the, the play Avenue Q. We're all a little bit racist. I'm sad, but it's true. So we need to take that into consideration when we make any kind of evaluation, that part of our thought process is going to be influenced by our biases. And if we can recognize that, then maybe we can provide better care. Maybe we can do better research. I don't know if anybody saw, there was a study that came out last month that looked at children getting care for appendicitis in emergency rooms. And what they found was that Black children <clears throat> were less likely to receive opioid, you know, narcotic analgesics than white children were. If you adjust for age and ethnicity and insurance status and pain score, black children are less likely to receive narcotics than white children. Because you know that these black kids are going to grow up to be heroin addicts, right? So you don't want to give them narcotics in the ER because they're just going to get hooked. Right? No, that's not it at all. It's because there's something about the care that we're giving that suggests to us that we don't want to give these black kids what is state-of-the-art medicine. Well, we'll give them some Tylenol, we'll give them some aspirin, because so they can't get hooked on that. But, man, not, the, not the hard stuff. Um, there was uh, an analysis that was published a couple of years ago on funding for sickle cell disease, strikes African Americans, versus cystic fibrosis, strikes whites. Both diseases diagnosed early on, about the same mortality rate for both diseases, about three times as many people in this country who have sickle cell disease versus cystic fibrosis. Private funding for cystic fibrosis, about 400 times that private funding for, for sickle cell disease. Okay, so white people have more money. We get that. They're going to contribute more to cystic fibrosis funding than they are to sickle cell disease. Okay, understand that. The NIH also provides more funding for cystic fibrosis, even though there are three times as many people with sickle cell disease. The NIH is funding more for, sickle cell, for cystic fibrosis than it is for sickle cell disease. Why is that? Do I think that the NIH is fundamentally prejudiced? No, I don't think so. But what I do think is that there are fewer researchers who are interested in sickle cell disease, that there are cystic fibrosis. And part of that is that we are producing fewer minority researchers and physicians who might be more likely to pursue those lines of thought than the majority. And the same goes for you know, things like breast cancer research and colorectal cancer research. So, as Dr. Alameen says, you know, we need to think of this more organically and holistically. And we need to take into consideration all of the processes that play into how we get to where we want to get, how we bring in students into the medical school, how we bring in the house staff, how we bring in graduate students, how we bring in the faculty, how we promote them. And if we can adjust for some of those biases, maybe some of those inequities, both in our enterprise and the general health care disparities, will resolve. Thank you.
So we have a good amount of time for a discussion, and one of the things that's often nicest about the Medical Center Hour is actually the diversity of our audience, um, because we hear from many different perspectives. Um, students, faculty, staff, um, age differences, disciplinary differences, and so I hope some of that will come out in our conversation. Um, today. So when you ask a question or offer a comment, please um, identify yourself and wait for uh, one of the two mics to be brought to you. So who would like to start? Hi, I'm Lisa Rollins in the Department of Family Medicine. I'm interested, uh, you presented the student numbers for UVA, but I'm curious how we're doing in terms of our faculty and resident numbers, because they're the ones who end up really creating the learning environment for our students. And I know in the past, a lot of the minority students have said they've not felt as though it was the most welcoming environment for them. I'm very glad you asked that. Um, so yeah, this is great. What we're doing at the house staff level and the faculty level is nowhere near what we're seeing at the student level. Um, house staff about 7%, which is about half the national average. Uh, Full-time faculty about 4%, which again is about half the national average. Um, so there is a great deal of work that needs to be done. Um, part of the problem is that, and I actually had a focus group with the medical students earlier this year, um, the minority students, and I asked them, you know, why they're not staying, because clearly they're not. Um, and actually, they didn't feel like the UVA environment was a problem for the most part. There were some sort of isolated instances that they related, but few and far between. Mostly, they didn't feel like Charlottesville is a great place to be if you're a minority middle class, upper middle class professional person, um, which is a problem. Um, but I think the, you know, the sort of the answer, the rejoinder for that is, if the only thing that differentiates us from a larger city is the size of the city, in terms of the, the minds of the students or the house staff or prospective faculty members are looking at us, if the only thing that differentiates us is the size of the city, we're doing a terrible job of differentiating us, <laughs> right? Hello, my name is Chelsea Parker and I'm a fourth year nursing student. Um, thank you for your um, talk about diversity and not giving, giving us a, like a typical, a typical lecture on diversity as I've often experienced here at the University of Virginia. Um, as far as diversity is concerned, um, it's, it's definitely disheartening um, being in the School of Nursing as a fourth year and being one of about five um, African American students, uh, three of us sitting here now, um, in the fourth year nursing school, um, um, nursing school. So I was just wondering. Um, I know Dean Lafontaine has like given lots of, has been trying to get our, our numbers up, et cetera. But on on the school of medicine side, have you guys ever thought about maybe collaborating with us um, over in the school of nursing uh, for students of color, et cetera? Um, so we, I don't know if you know Susan Coles. Um, uh, Susan Coles is sort of my counterpart at the School of Nursing, um, and she is a member of the School of Medicine's Diversity Consortium. So we meet monthly, and she, we have conversations. And this is, you know, it's it's an ongoing problem. I think Dean Fontaine and, and Susan Coles recognize this. I don't know that we have solutions as yet. Um, I think efforts are underway. But I think part of the solution is going to be reaching a critical mass. You know, this line didn't sort of happen all by itself. And one of the things that has come out of this, as uh, Dr. Canberra was saying as last year, that the minority medical students who are here now compared to previous years, they're not just more of them, but they feel better about being here. They feel more um, open to contributing in, in the class. So there is, a, I think, a critical mass effect. Um, you haven't gotten there yet. Um, and again, I, you know, yes, we would, I think, very much like to, to see progress made at the School of Nursing comparable to what's seen at the School of 
of medicine, but I think it's just going to take some time. Eugene Shatkin, retired physician. How do foreign medical graduates affect the diversity of UVA staff? So, can you say that again? I'm sorry. Foreign medical yes. graduates. How do they? How do they affect the diversity in your UVA staff? So I, I don't have any numbers on that. The um, foreign medical graduates are included in the you know, the, the numbers for um, all the faculty and the house staff. So they're not not broken out at all. I can tell you that they are there's certainly not a preponderance of foreign medical graduates just from knowing who's here. Um, there certainly are some, but it's it's not the majority. Is it worth a foreign medical graduate to apply for residency training here? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I don't think that there's any in and of itself issues with a foreign medical graduate um, applying here. If they're qualified just as they would be um, for a U.S. graduate. Um, I'm Brian. I'm a fourth year MSDP student. Um, Dr. Alamine, uh, I thought, told an interesting story that just the numbers of representation of underrepresented minorities is not sufficient. Um, beyond, I guess, looking at these graphs of you know, increasing numbers of representation, um, are there any efforts uh, by the UPA School of Medicine to kind of nurture the students that are already present who are part of these groups? So um, there are a couple of uh, student representation groups, the SNMA, Student National Medical Association, and the Latino Medical Student Association, there's also QMD uh, for the LGBT community. Um, so there are you know, groups that are, you know, form support groups for um, uh, medical students. We have talked in our diversity consortium about broadening our horizons. You know, the medical school is a, you know, a bit of a silo, I think, for many of the medical students and the, and, and the house staff here as well, that we sort of tend to get isolated here. Um, at the, the hospital, and I think it would be worthwhile. We've been, we have started efforts to try to collaborate with the other graduate schools um, to make a, a larger, warmer, welcoming community here at UVA. Hi, I'm John Ashley, a retired, I'm not retired, I'm a part time uh, physician surveyor for the Joint Commission. I have the great privilege of going to hospitals and small communities. And, major cities all across the country. We we're talking about uh, disparities as well as uh, diversity here. The end point of medical school and nursing school is to get people practicing where the care is needed the most to eliminate diversity. When I go to these hospitals in these poor communities, I see uh, only the international medical graduates in medicine taking care of people in small rural communities. And sort of the same thing in, in impoverished urban areas, and the only nurses I see are ADN graduates. What are the schools doing to, in fact, incentivize and motivate the students to, once having gotten in with their diversity, to then go out and serve the population most in need of their care? I think one program that I'm turning on is, I'm sorry, turn on one program that I'm aware of is some of the loan repayment programs with fairly qualified health centers that are really able to identify um, where the physician shortage areas are. And most of the studies do show that you have more minority students who are willing to go to underserved communities and rural communities as well to actually serve. So I think that um, the loan repayment makes a big difference to really get students to come back into a different area, especially when people are coming out with such a huge level of debt. But I think that it's really everybody's responsibility, not just the minority students, but everybody's responsibility to come in and to take care of some of our indigent areas and areas in need as well. I think we've, uh, we'll take one more, one more question. Thanks for the moment. I'm Carney in internal medicine. Thanks for a, a good presentation, great presentation. Um, I really have, in reading about this, gotten the feeling that the pipeline issue is one of the biggest biggest issues. Um, we have the SEMDEP program to help train uh, under, underrepresented minorities and so forth. But when you get down to the issues of high school, middle school, elementary school, um, how do you think that 
can be addressed? What might be the most effective way to get more people thinking, I want to be a doctor and nurse? You know. Well, I think one issue that we need to do is to get more people in front of them. Um, and I also think we need to start collaborating with our teachers. The MDs need to start collaborating with the teachers to make sure that the STEM is being supported at that level. Because they have actually shown that by the time somebody's in third grade, they've decided they're going to be a doctor or they're not going to be a doctor. It's that low of a level. And we're, you know, most of our programs are focused on the SNDP, where we really need to start focusing more on in this area here in Albemarle, are we making sure that every school has a science fair contest? Are we making sure that every school is actually um, exposing children to UVA so that they're actually inside the hospital, not when they're sick, but just to walk around and to see that, oh, this is an environment that I could potentially see myself in. So I think that we do need to make sure that we're reaching down and nurture those key students just like we're able to identify these are our talented students in undergrad, we need to identify those students in third grade and provide them with the support from the beginning. So I think every elementary school should be linked up in some way. So maybe, I know at SIU, at Southern Illinois University, our medical students have actually adapt, adopted one of the elementary schools in the indigent areas. We do all of our health fairs, we go and do presentations, and the medical students actually tutor these students once a week just to make sure that they are in contact with um, medical providers and medical students and see this as a part of their vision. I think we're out of time for today and I don't see any third graders in the audience, but when you run across them, inspire them. Uh, when you see them at Thanksgiving, inspire them. Ask um, them on the doctor's visit, what do you want to be when you grow up? So thank you all. Thank you, Wendy Elamine and Greg Townsend.